We've been walking through this letter uh, that we have in our Bibles, near the end of our Bibles, called the book of Hebrews. It was a letter written in the first century to what we believe were Jewish Christians, had a profound understanding of the Old Testament. And uh, we've been studying it leading up to Easter and finding out what that message says to us today as, as followers of Christ in the 21st um, century. Today, we take a shift in that book. We've been, we've been in it for, for five weeks now. You see there at the top, uh, by the way, I wanna talk to you about superior living. Come on, say that with me. Superior living, three ways that we can live superior lives. Now, the outline of, of this letter in general could be outlined this way. The first part is chapters one through nine, and it deals with the idea over and over and over again. I've been talking about it for five weeks. You, you guys are probably serious with this. Let's move on. Is this, is the idea of the absolute far superiority of Christ over everything. That's your first fill in the blank. We're moving. I know we're moving. And over and over, the, the, the writer to the Hebrews, remember who the audience is, Jewish Christians who understood the Old Testament very well. Not so today. That's why we have to slow down and, and unpack what it means. Um, he says that Jesus is superior to angels. Jesus is superior to Moses. He's superior to Joshua. He's superior to anything you've read about in the Old Testament. He's superior to, to the, the high priesthood. He's superior to the tabernacle. He's superior to all of it. Uh, in fact, here are some of the themes. Think about this. This is first century Christians. Here are some of the ways they identified Jesus. Let's read it together. You have your note sheet out. There's a little paragraph there. Uh, and this is the way he was, let's read it out loud together, the way he was identified. Jesus is the, the son of God, the radiance of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's nature, the agency of creation, the one who holds all things together, the heir of all things, the mighty word of God, our everlasting high priest, our intercessor, the pioneer of our salvation, the anchor of our hope, the purification for our sins, the great shepherd of the sheep, the seated supreme ruler over, over some things. Come on, say the seated. The seated supreme ruler over all things. Now he's laying that out for the, the largest part of the book. That's, that's how they saw um, Jesus. By the way, if you have a different Jesus, uh, then you're probably not going to experience the superior living that he brings. Are you here? And the very last part of the book, this is part two, this is your second fill in the blank. He says, he makes a shift and that's where we're gonna camp out today. If this is true, everything we just said, if he's the son of God, if he's the agent of creation, if he's the heir of all things, if he's the purification, all this grand stuff, if that's true, then how should we live? And then the very last part of this book, he's gonna get very, uh, very practical. Now, the only reason I bring that out to you is because I, can, I bump up into people sometimes who were trying to live the Christian life do the Christian things, but they really don't have a deep understanding and an appreciation of who Christ is. So if we try to live the Christian life with an inadequate Christ, it's gonna be super frustrating, super exhausting. In fact, a lot of times your friends will laugh at that because it's, it's built upon a foundation of correct theology. Pastor, that's a, that's a big word. Let's get the order here. So it's it's, and it's just like Hebrews is laid out. First get the theology correct, and then you can get your living correct. But if you try to start with your living, you won't be building upon a sure foundation. You won't know the why of the reason you're living the way you're living. Are you here? So here's another fill in the blank in your notes. Here's the idea uh, is that correct theology or correct thinking about God is the source or the foundation for healthy and correct living for God. So in the book of Hebrews, he painstakingly says, remember, 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 Christ is superior. Now, if we embrace that, it ought to lead to, come on, help me out. We're a thinking church. Now, the, uh, uh, I want you to engage your minds. It ought to live, lead to superior living. If he is 
superior. So there in your notes, you see there, superior Christ, superior what? Superior living. Here are three ways how we ought to live in this last uh, section, uh, part of, of Hebrews. Uh, by the way, there is so much packed in those, those last remaining four chapters, all kind of ways. It talks about marriage. I mean, Christian theology all of a sudden gets really practical on how we live. There are all kinds of things. But I was, want, I was thinking, how in the world am I going to cover all this? Uh, here's a way we're going to do it. There are six times in this last section that he says this phrase, let us, let us. We can't cover all of them, but we're going to cover, cover three of them. Three times he says, if this is true about Christ, then let us do this. Now, if it wasn't so corny, I would have titled the message, Three Kinds of Hebrew Let Us. Okay. You'll get that later. Hebrews chapter 10. Some of you are like, what in the world's happening? Um, verse 19. Remember, these are the let us statements, how we ought uh, to live. Therefore, by the way, if you're new with this, anytime scripture's up there, let's, let's go ahead and read it out loud together. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have a confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new open for us through the curtain that is his... Can we, can we just stop right there? I just have to explain that real quick. Remember constantly that the... That the that the group he's writing to had a profound understanding of the tabernacle in the Old Testament. It's not true today. That's why we've, we've been going back and forth. He draws an analogy again. He says there's a new, keep the scripture up there, there's a new and living way open for us through what? Through the curtain that is what? His body. Even that doesn't mean much to us, but remember the tabernacle. They would have remembered it that Aaron, the high priest, would, would go before the holy place, but then only one time a year he could open the veil and go where? Into the most holy place and access the presence of God. He came with the sacrifice on his hands, a sacrifice of a blood of an animal. This was ancient Israel, Old Testament Israel. But the early Christians saw Jesus as a fulfillment of everything that they used to practice, but Jesus didn't just do it for a nation but he did it for the entire world. He himself wasn't the blood of an animal, but it was, the, it was the freely offered of his own life. He brought his blood in. Now you see this phrase, by a new and living way, he goes through the curtain and it says that is his body. What was happening on the cross? The early Christians saw on the cross that Jesus' body was being rent. His body was broken so that we might have access, not one time, but for all eternity, access to the very presence of God through what he has done on our behalf. Are you here? And he's saying, remember what Christ has done. It's superior than any other thought or philosophy or way of living. He's opened a brand new living way for us through what he has done on the cross. By the way, that ancient high priest could only come in there once a year and see and experience the presence of God. But when Jesus was on the cross and his body was being broken for us to open a new and living way, we could actually see what God is like. What's he like? His love is so deep and beyond we can fathom that he would actually give his life for us. I know we could just pass by that little phrase, but I want you to say he's opened the curtain for us. That is, he, he opened it through what he did um, on, on the cross. How appropriate we remember that on Holy Week in the beginning of Palm uh, Sunday. Let's, let's keep reading. By, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the real house of God, this isn't just an earthly tabernacle, this is the, the heavenly tabernacle. Because of all that, here's the first let us statement, verse 22. Let us draw near, near to God. Now, we'll, we'll keep reading the rest in just a moment. But the first, first statement in superior living is because if this is true about Christ, we should live our lives near or close to God. 
I just want to ask you a question. Why don't we do that? If we have the opportunity to live near, near the Lord, why don't we do so, Pastor? Um, um, maybe it's because we're busy. And let me just, in, in passing, just suggest that if, that if there's any activity that keeps us away or distant from God or his family, be careful. That thing or that activity is not superior than drawing near to God through Christ. That's what the writer is reminding us. You say, well, maybe I, I know maybe one of the reasons we, we might stay distant from God is because there's this internal, I don't know, uneasiness. I, I feel like God's disappointed in me. I messed up. You don't know how many times I, I've heard people like, hey, you want to come to church? And I'm not going to church. Church is for good people. I'm afraid if I go into church, the, 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 the roof might cave in. <laughs> you know, I've, 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 I've done some things. By the way, by the way, what I'm describing, that feeling, maybe that guilty feeling, I want to suggest, by the way, we're a thinking church. You don't have to agree with me, but I'm reasoning with you. At least have reasons. That guilty feeling is normal and healthy. It's that, I don't think I've done right. I don't think I'm living right. But here's, here's the million dollar question. That's healthy. What are you going to do with that? You're just going to stay away? You're just going to live without accessing the, the help and the, and the strength of God? Look, look at the writer of the Hebrews says this, this is what we can do. He says, verse 22, he says, let us draw near to God with a, with a, with a what? With a sincere heart, with the, having our hearts, come on, stay with me here. I want you to read, having our what? Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Again, the people he's writing to would get it immediately because they're thinking of their Old Testament, the history. The, the high priest would sprinkle them clean with the sacrifice. But Jesus is the fulfillment of all that. When I receive him, he, when I receive what he's done, he forgives me and cleanses my conscience. And he's also that big, that big uh, tub of water that was in the tabernacle. Anybody approaching God had to first wash themselves in that, in that water. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. There's no longer a tub. In him, I'm, my body is washed and I'm clean to be able to come before, before him. I receive what he's done with full faith in, in what he's accomplished. So here's the question in your notes. What in the world are we talking about? What's the big deal why live? Why live close to God? We're going to let the writer answer this. this is Hebrews 4, 16. Let us, there's another let us, let us come with confidence to God's throne of judgment. I'm sorry. To, let us come to God's throne of what? Throne of grace. There we will receive. Here's some things we receive when we come to God. Receive what? Mercy. We find grace to help us when we need it most. What's the big deal about living close to God? Here, here's the answer in notes. I just want you to think about it. The big deal is living far superior than any other way of living. I, I, I live my life walking in the mercy, in the favor, the tangible help, the evident help of God in my life. When I go to work, I go to work differently than everybody else. Why? Because of what God has done through the gift of his son. I, I, I go to his throne and I receive mercy and I receive, and I receive help. By the way, there's, there's, a, there's an interesting phrase as we're passing through here. Um, with confidence. Let us with confidence, therefore, come to God's, come into the most holy place just like they used to do, but they couldn't really go. Only one person could go who represented everybody. But something happened when Jesus came. He opened the way through him for everyone. Not just one nation, but all the nations of the earth come and experience. So let us come with confidence. What does that mean with confidence? Um, I, I was thinking last week that 
it was a good example. Um, we had a guest come, our representative in Richmond in the, in the General Assemblies, uh, Senator Sue Haas Sobramonium was here. And I didn't know he came with his wife and, and two little girls. And as they came to church, they, they came in downstairs and one of the little girls re recognized one of her good friends that was in children's church. And she said, can I go to children's church? Can I go to children's church? Because her friend was in there. And they said, sure. And so the, the other little girl didn't have a friend that was in children's church and no way, this is the first time in this building, no way she's going to children's church, clinging to her parents. And, and, and they, they, they come up here and, and I meet the family talking, where's, where's your other little daughter? Oh, she saw a friend, she's in children's church. And the other little girl, no way, no way, I'm staying here. I don't know anybody. And uh, you know, she didn't get the experience of what I wanted her to see kids and all the fun, all the excitement that was happening down there, but she didn't know anybody. Um, have you ever, ever been invited to a party or a um, connect group? Better yet, you ever been to a church? Been invited to church? You don't know anybody? Do you know how difficult it is just walking through those doors? If you don't know a soul? Now, some people who are weird love that kind of stuff. They love going, they love going where they don't, not me. They love going where they don't know anybody. Hey, no, no, no. If I'm invited where I don't know a soul, it's awkward. Now, if you've never experienced that, I'm, but, but I'm telling you, what happens emotionally inside when you, you're invited, you're going to that thing, you're nervous? In fact, if you're like me, if you're invited somewhere, you start finding ways not to go. Uh, you know, and you probably don't end up going or experiencing what you could experience. But what happens to you emotionally uh, when you find out uh, one of your good friends is going to be there. Come on, I'll be real. I'm, I'm reasoning with you. Hey, I'm going to be there. Oh, all of a sudden something changes. Uh, 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 where are you going to be? Can, can we meet outside? Tell me exactly where you're going to be. <laughs> and then, then we'll connect. But the whole atmosphere of your spirit and your mind changes. The level, come on, are you here? The level of your confidence changes. Why? Because you have someone who's gone before you, who can vouch for you, who knows you, who can connect with you. There's a relationship. It is the same way with God. The writer to the Hebrews says, remember Jesus. Remember he's superior and he's gone before you. Jesus lives in the presence of his father. So I can imagine it, something like this. He's in the presence of the father. And let's just say, um, Kelly uh, wants to approach the presence of the throne of grace. I need real, some of you, this isn't religion. I'm talking about something real. I need real mercy. I need real grace. I need tangible help in my life. So Kelly wants to come in the presence of God, but she knows Jesus is already there. Hey, Kelly. Hey, Father. This is Kelly. She's gladly accepted what we've done for her on her behalf, and she's so thankful. She's going through a hard time right now. She thinks that when she prays that, that, that you're not listening and you're not there and you're not really hearing her pray. Father, you, you remember when I was on earth? I know exactly what that feels like. Come on. Remember what the writer of the Hebrews writing? We have a great high priest who knows what it is to suffer like we suffer. He says, Father, I know what that's like. Hey, Kelly, Kelly, come here. Uh, because you've accepted us and you've accepted what God has done, He's not just my father, but he's your father. And you can call him heavenly father. Go ahead and tell him all that you need. And Kelly comes in and she approaches the throne of grace where she finds what? Help. Present help, tangible help in my real life in the here. Now, draw near. I live my life with the tangible help of God in my life. How? Because of Christ. I can live my life that way. Near, come on, let us. Come on, say let us. That's what he said. Come on, let us. Don't forget this. We weren't just talking theology. It, it makes a practical every day. Every day you can draw near the presence of God and find grace and help when we need it most. So let us. Come on, say let us. You know, sometimes we just, um, we just need some help doing that. Let's be honest. We, we need some brothers and sisters around us. The, 
I put in your note just an opportunity. By the way, this thing's been surging, growing, growing exponentially. Not, not a little bit of growth, just exponentially. People coming in here on Tuesday morning for TMP. Come on, somebody help me out. What's TMP? Tuesday morning prayer. Guess what? At Tuesday morning prayer, there's no moving lights. Choo, choo, choo. There's no fog machine. There's no, like, pastor coming out of the closet going, wow. No, 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 no. We just turn the lights on. And there's all kind of people coming. And together, come on, say together. I don't have to do this alone. Sometimes I have a feeling, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. But together, we come in here and we can access the strength. We can draw near on, live, live near the help and strength of God. I was sitting here, I was somewhere, and someone, I saw them putting on their jacket. Uh, they were at TMP, and I had to scoot out a little early. I said, turn around, wait down. I said, you're going to have a great day. She's like, thank you. I need it. A lot of stuff happening today. <laughs> And just when she was saying that, Pastor Preston was down here and he said, I just feel like some of us are having some big challenges today. You're going to work, you're going to face something and you know it. And I looked at her and she said, so I started running out the door. He said, come down here. We want to pray together. She came down here and we got to pray over. What were we doing? Drawing near. By the way, you don't have to live this way if you don't want to. The Christian lifestyle, the Christianity can just be a nice thing. But really never tapping into the reality of it and what God's done. Let us draw near to us. The, the very next verse, he gives another let us. Let's, let's read it again. This, this is um, verse 23. We just read 22. Let us, here's the next let us, let us hold tightly to the confession of, of our hope without wavering because we can trust God. The writer says, hold tightly. Hold tightly to what? Come on, put it back up there. Put it back up there. I've been thinking about this all week. You just said it for the first time. Hold tightly to what? That was so pathetic. Come on, let's say it again. Hold tightly to what? The it's words coming out of your mouth. Hold tightly to what you're saying, the confession of your hope. Hold tightly to it without wavering. Come on, nudge somebody and say, stop wavering. Come on, tell them, stop, stop wavering. Hold tightly to the, because he who promised, he's faithful. He'll keep his word. What is a confession of hope? Let me just suggest to you that it's not a confession of doubt. It's not a confession of anxiety. It's not a confession of pessimism. It's not a confession of fear. It's not a confession of woe is me. It's a confession of hope. Some of us here were holding tightly to a confession of pessimism. And the writer says, if Christ is truly superior, all the things I've said hold tightly to this confession of hope. So what is that confession of hope? The confession of hope, I think this is a fill in blank, is, a, is, a, um, is, is the word, it's, it's a declaration, there it is. It's a declaration of what we believe, of our faith. Uh, it's not just a feeling, it's the content, there it is. There's actually content to what we believe. Hold fastly to that, it's our we might say it's our creed, it's our statement of belief. One of the earliest statements of faith in the church, the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth. Come on, you ever heard that before? I believe, I'm not gonna let go of this. I believe in God my Father, almighty. There's nothing too difficult for him. He's the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. But on the third day, he rose again. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I'm not going to let go of Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy 
spirit. Lord, thank you for your spirit. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the resurrection of the body. I believe in life eternal. These are the things I'm going to hold on to. Not loosely, but I'm going to hold on to them. Now, my faith, my faith, um, in, 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 in your notes, we should, what does that mean? We should, I love this word tenaciously. I should have made it a fill in the blank. We should tenaciously hold on to the faith that we profess. I love this next phrase. Come on, say it with me. Come what may. You know, it's easy to hold on to that statement I was just saying when everything's going all right. Job's good, marriage is good, you know, church is good, all the stuff is good, and I got it. But what happens when everything starts to shake? What happens when the roller coaster goes off the cliff? If you're normal, I'm going through it. How many times when, when, when everything starts to shake, do we start... We start letting go of the very thing that's the, that's the anchor of our lives. Here, here's another way to question. What would it take to, to, to cause you to let go of your faith? You say, uh, you say what's the big deal? I would say, I would suggest, I'm just reasoning with you. I would suggest if you lose that faith, what have you... Just think about what you've lost. Um, by the way, the writer of the Hebrews, he reminds the, the hearers, he goes, uh, and I'm, we're going to read it. This is real people. He goes, I want you to remember when, when this happened to you and look how they responded. Um, we're in 1032. The writer says, think back on those early, is it up there? Okay, as soon as it's up there, I want you to read with me. Think back. On those early days when you first learned, remember how you suffered, how, how much, how much they suffer? Remember how you suffered many things yet. Keep, keep the scripture up there. I just want you to let it, Holy Spirit, I want you to let it sink in. What difference did faith make? I can suffer a lot of things, but I will not be defeated. I can go through a lot of things, but, but, but my mind, I, I, I'm anchored. You suffered many things, but you were not defeated. Oh, Lord. Oh. The Holy Spirit's trying to help somebody. You're in a struggle, and you're, the very thing that's going to pull you out of the struggle, you're being tempted by all the culture and everything around you and the wrong friends you have around, and the radio, all the stuff you listen to, to let go of the very thing that can pull you out yeah. and put your feet on solid ground. You suffered many things, but yet you couldn't be defeated by that struggle. Sometimes, look at verse 33. Let's keep going. This, now remember, this is, this is not a myth. These are real people living in probably the time of Nero. Uh, the, the supreme emperor, Caesar, who was not a, a big fan of Christians. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule, uh, and were beaten, sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail, and when all you own was taken from you... Now, hold on, hold on. Keep, keep the truth right there. How can you accept that with joy? Because I have confidence in something else. That cannot be taken away from me. You can take all this stuff away from me, but I have better possessions that are permanent and eternal in God. Everything you see here, by the way, is temporary. You, you accepted it with joy. You knew. What were you talking about there? You were talking about a faith. You knew there were, come on, say better things. Come on, say better things. You knew there were better things waiting for you. Things that are eternal and last 
forever. The people of God have always been a people who do not walk simply by what they see. I walk by faith. By the way, faith is seeing for the first time. That's why Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord's on me. He's anointing me to open the eyes of the blind. I'm going to help you see, really see. You knew, you knew, if it's up there, you knew there were better things waiting for you. Someone needs to hold on to that. Wait a second, this isn't all there is. There are better things. So do not, look how he wraps this all up. Do not throw away or let go of this confident trust in the Lord. Remember, remember what? The great reward. Oh my goodness, we had, uh, I'll just give you a practical example. We have one of the uh, uh, dear ladies in this church at the gala. It was towards the end, they were dancing. And this lady was dancing and smiling. I was, I was sitting there, first of all, mesmerized because I can't dance like that, twirling all around. And, um, but I knew her story not too long ago. The cancer came back to her husband and we cried and prayed and prayed and cried, but it didn't, he didn't get better. And he died. And I remember talking to her during the time, during that time, she said, Pastor, I, I, I can't describe, I, the only thing I can say, I feel Jesus, he's carrying me. Literally, that He's carrying me right now. You know, modern researchers right now, every study. Anyway, back to that story when I saw her dance, I was like, you go ahead, girl. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we don't walk through stuff. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean I don't cry. I just cry differently. I just, I hurt differently. Research says every, every side, I'm a science person. Okay. I've been asking you a reason for a long time. All points to the fact that hope is the vital ingredient to survival. Whether I'm in a concentration camp, I've got terminal cancer, I've been disappointed. I, I thought I would have been married by now. I could go on and on and on, on and on and on. But when hope, the confession of my hope, God, you're not against me. You've never been against me. You've been, you've been for me. Lord, it's been me who's been working against you. I've been working against reality, but in your goodness, you're, you're aligning me again with the way the world works, the world you create. And I just, I, uh, what's the big deal? What's the big deal about it? By the way, you, we don't have to live this way. What's the big deal? We're going to let the, the writer of the Hebrews answer this. The big deal, chapter 6, verse 18, we... We who, read the scripture with me if you would. We who have fled to God for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. We can have this hope. Oh my God. Some of you pulled up the anchor. And the boat of your life is just going every current, every stream up and down. Some of us have never even had an anchor. You've tried different anchors, but they're never strong enough. And so the writer says, remember, remember early Christians. And he's reminding us today, Holy Spirit, remember you have this, you have Christ as an anchor for your soul, sure and strong. 
Well, what's the big deal about that? Well, the big deal is facing and overcoming whatever this life throws my way. Whatever happens in this life, I got an anchor. Anchor in my life. The last let us statement, by the way, there's more. This is only three of them. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us, come on, let's say it together. Let us think of ways to spur one another on. Spur one another on to what? Spur one another on to what? Let us think of what? Think of ways. By the way, this is all a definition of the church. This is what the church is. We think of ways to be an avalanche of goodness and love on people. This is a, oh goodness, it's not a political rally. This is how we think of ways to do what? Spur one another on. Stir one another. By the way, what's a spur do? Come on, Western Loudoners. <laughs> this is your chance. You put a spur. You tell the horse where to go. Horses just stand there. You do a little kick with the spur. <laughs> Pastor, I'd probably just be sitting here on my hands watching, not, not making it happen, not participating, I'd probably still be watching in the stands what God is trying to do. But I came into the house, the family of God, and I found myself being spurred a little bit, stirred on, encouraged to make a difference in not just my life, it's not just about me, but I want to see other people Blessed. Let us think of ways. Come on. I'm sorry, I didn't get the, the scripture finished. Let's, let's read it together. Let us think of ways to spur one another on toward love and let, here's another one, and let us not, I can't believe this is in the Bible. This is not in the Bible. Let, and by the way, congratulations. Some of you right now, I'm so glad I came to church today. This was a good Sunday. Let us not stay away from church as some. Oh, my God. Come on, say, keep meeting together. Keep coming together. Keep encouraging one another. Let's not stay away. By the way, it just reminds me that there's not too much new. There was still temptation in the first century and early Christians to Man, Nero's on the throne. We might probably safer to stay back. No, no, let's, 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 let's keep coming together. Let's keep stirring one another up. Uh, not so we can hold picket signs. Let's stir one another up so we can, we can pour love, the love of God on people. Let's, let's figure out a way to do some good deeds. Let the light shine. So thankful we don't have to do this alone, but we do it. Come on, are you here? We do, we do it together. We do it together. I'm, I need to wrap this up. I'm, Friday night, I'm going to bed. It's late. I, I pass the door, going down the basement, and I hear my son down there on, uh, on Fortnite. I think it's Fortnite. Got his headphones on, got a little microphone. Yelling and screaming at people, having a big time. Like, ah, 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 no, no, woo! Ah. All the stuff. Talking to his buddies. Hey, it's getting late. When you come up, turn up all the lights. So I went to bed. I went to bed with him playing. Saturday morning, I woke up early. Go downstairs. I'm rolling around, fixing my cup of coffee. Hear yelling, screaming. <laughs> now, now, he did go to bed. I'm going to confess for him. He went to bed for a little bit, but then woke up early. 
Texted all his buddies. And they all got back on wherever they were in all the parts of the world. Oh, no, woo! <laughs> now, if I allowed that, mom and dad, parents, you know what I'm talking about. If I allowed that, he wouldn't come up for air. Wouldn't eat dinner. Wouldn't eat dinner. Couple of hours pass. I said, "Son, hey, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you who did. Hey, Jude. <laughs> there was nobody else home anyway. I said, hey, Jude, we're going we gotta do something today. Come on, are you here? We gotta do something. Won't you turn the game off? Come on, pick up all the stuff, all the taki wrappers, all the stuff off the floor. I can even see it in my mind. Pick up everything." Bring it upstairs, and we're, and we're going we're to change the filters in the house. Um, by the way, when I thought about the stuff out, the, you know, Saturday chores, that's something I can do by myself. I don't need him. But I said, come on, put down the video game. We got... Hey, go get the ladder. One of them, we got to climb up on a ladder to change the filter. And be, 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 be careful, son. Look, look at the direction, the way the filter goes before you pull it out, because we'll never figure that out. What's, okay, you got, you got the, okay. I'm going to hand it to you. Do the same direction. I could do it myself. And it's the same way with God. He, he could do it himself. But he has a family. Are you here? It's a real family on the earth that he wants to succeed. Succeed in what? Thinking of ways. Planning ways to, 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 to be a blessing, to be. And I just feel like the Holy Spirit, by the way, that led us, that led us, let's keep participation in the family of God. If you don't keep it, you're going to lose it. Keep it a high priority. And you say why? I want you, I'm reasoning with you right now. If Christ is far superior than anything, then wh why is his family not treated as superior in our activities and all the stuff we're doing? Doesn't make sense. Something's not jiving. But if he's really who he said he is, then this family right here, Lord, let's, let's, let's keep encouraging one another. Let's keep coming together. God only has one plan, one family to make a difference, one team to bring heaven, a little bit of heaven down to earth. And that's, that's called his church. Are you a part of it? I'm, I'm talking real. And I feel like the Holy Spirit, it's not a, like a literal video game, even though for some of us it could be, or like a real video game. But it's an activity, it's something that he's saying, son, there's some things we need to do. Turn off the distraction. Change your schedule. What you're doing and getting yourself caught up in is far below the potential we could do together. And that's what the church is, together. It's not by myself. We can't do it. Look what we could do. Together. You say, what's the big deal? The big deal is what God's trying to do. We are, come on, we are God's plan to bless the world. We are. Come on, say we are. We are. Together, we are. Come on, say, say the next line. Together, that means everybody has a part to play. Together, we can help. Not just, but others experience the love of of God. You know what's incredible right now? Pastor Preston was telling me that uh, this is the most people we've had sign up and join Team Orange. By the way, what's Team Orange? Team Orange is the team that serves here at church.
They facilitate miracles. By the way, you sitting in that chair is because other people were thinking and planning, how can we bless somebody else's life? How can we watch their kids? How can we park their car? How can we fix some coffee? How can we greet them when they come in? Thank you, strategizing. That's what Team Orange is. Some of you are going, what in the world's Team Orange? Is that because this church loves orange? Well, <laughs> Team Orange is an acronym, 10 letters, T-E-A, all the way down, and each one of those letters represent one of our values. It represents how we want to serve the Lord together. That's what Team Orange means. So I want to ask you, are you helping facilitate miracles for other people? And if not, why not? Why not today? Say, if Christ is superior, then I want his family. Let's get on with it. Let's get on with pouring out love and good works. How do I do that? You run right out here to the orange tables. I met a guy, uh, whenever it was, we were walking out. He said, Pastor Charlie, I can feel it. There's something different about the church. How long have you been coming? You've been coming, been coming a couple months, but there's this energy. There's this life in it, and we're growing. And I said, we are growing. Come on, say we're growing. We're growing. And he said, man, this is great. I can see like in just a matter of no time, this place is gonna be running over with people. I said, man, that's fabulous. Hey, have you joined Team Orange? He said, looked at me like I was, I must have monkeys coming out of my ear or something. I said, that's the team that makes church happen. Well, I said, well, come on. And we went to the orange tables and, and uh, I want you to come start helping us make a difference. Why do you say that? Because did I, did I say how many or did I get lost? Huh? I got lost. Thank you. So. In just the past several months, we've had 90, over 90 people join Team Orange. Come on, church. That's fabulous. Because of the exponential growth, people are just coming and tasting. God's good. God's good. They're learning to live life superior. But that superior life is built on the right foundation. But the more the church grows, how many know the more people we need help, helping bless and in love? Say it again. Look at there. Um, do you know in six months, we need 132 more? That could be you. That could be you. Maybe the Holy Spirit's saying, daughter, come on. Come on. Everybody has a part to play. Come on, let's pray. Let's, let's, would you bow your heads? Lord, we just pause right now. Lord, we remember what you said that this, this place that we're in right now, that this would be a place of prayer for all people. Lord, I pray that each person, maybe those who've been here for a long time, Lord, those who are new among us, Lord, may they just sense your presence here. This is a place to, to come into the presence and to encounter the help and the clarity and the strength of God. Lord, I pray for many of us in here that, that our Christian life wouldn't be one of just theology. We, 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 we get the right answers. Lord, but may that be the foundation for moving into now, Lord, my life, the way I live my life. Lord, help me to draw near to you, not live distant from you, God. Lord, help me to hold on tightly to the profession of my faith. My hope, Lord, is in you. And Lord, I thank you for the family of God. Thank you for my brothers and sisters. Lord, thank you for others who have served, and I'm blessed because of it. Now, Lord, help me to be a part of that team, Lord, that's, that's seeing others blessed. I give you the praise. In Jesus' name. Come on, in Jesus' name. All of us sin.